Our next speaker is Mr. Robin Reiner. He is the president and CEO and chairman of EBIX, also founder of the Robin Reiner Foundation. I request the team to please play a short video introduction for him. Robin Reiner's video introduction, please. He is a successful business leader and also a well-known charity icon. Ebix India has 7,500 employees in India across 100 cities and processes a few hundred billion dollars in insurance premiums across the world. Robin is the only CEO featured in Fortune 500's 100 fastest growing companies list and has rung the Nasdaq opening and closing bell three times in New York. Robin is a strong believer in the Made in India campaign of the Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, and strives to create employment within the country. Robin has been leveraging his business success to support charity work. He is the producer of a film, Dilli, a film focusing on issues related to homeless people in metros like Delhi. The film won 25 international awards and reached the Oscars top 10 nomination lists. Celebrities from across the world have extended their support to Robin, including international sports stars, Bollywood celebrities and cricketers. He has won innumerable awards for his work and is also a big believer in compassionate capitalism. He runs schools in India, thousands of underprivileged children and has built 6,000 free homes for slum dwellers in Bwana of Delhi, Bawana of Delhi. He writes regularly about charity on social media and has more than 1.7 million fans. He has a belief of a coffin does not have pockets and heal the present to support the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause for the one and only Robin Reiner. Good afternoon, everybody. Is there a... Sorry. Is there a presentation here that I could run? So let me, let me get started by introducing myself uh, and talking about perspective. When you, when you think about charity per se, uh, charity is nothing but a state of mind. And when you think about state of mind, it's all about perspective. We as human beings, each one of us, has a different perspective to everything, right? Meaning some people think about charity naturally, some take a bit longer. Why is that so? It's perspective. We change our perspective as we grow, as we evolve. I'll give you a simple example on perspective from my own life. Four months back, I was walking like any one of you. I had a big accident. My vehicle overturned, and now, now I'm here walking on crutches. And what does it mean? I'll tell you what, how it changed my perspective. Today, I might have had different ambitions four months back, but today, if you ask me, what is my number one ambition? I'm not going to tell you the billions that I would like to make for eBay or the amazing something else. I'll tell you my ambition is to walk because that's a new reality of life for me that things that I took for granted, I probably have realized those are the small things that really matter. When you, when you, consider, uh, when you consider the thought of perspectives and then you look at what's happening today in India and around the world, India is creating amazing number of billionaires today. And India is creating an amazing number of millionaires today. And when you consider that, I think one thing that we have to realize today, when, you, when you're a millionaire or you're a billionaire, it comes with a little bit of responsibility. 
So, and it doesn't come naturally to people to be a philanthropist or to go into charity. I, this, I like to give you a simple story uh, of, a, I'm not going to give you a name, but I'll give you a simple story of a, of a so-called billionaire in Bombay, Mumbai, who was driving through the slums of Bombay to his lavish home, and he had one of his cousins with him, and he looked at the slums, and his cousin looked at it, and his cousin said, well, it's a pity. We go every day through this slum, and we go to this lavish home of ours, but ultimately, we still have to go through the slums. And he said, yeah, exactly. It is a pity, but look, think about it. Look at the amount of land these guys, these slum dwellers are sitting on. This is premium land. Imagine if we could build some really nice hotels out here, how much they would be worth. I, when I heard this story, the thought that came to my mind was rather simple. I thought, sometimes people forget. Coffin does not have a pocket, right? We sometimes think, we're gonna just keep making money and it will never end. I think, and then this happens. And what I mean by that is, four months back, I could have died also. I'm still alive, fortunately, and counting my blessings. But at the end of the day, it is very important to have a perspective and, have a, and, and start thinking about people who are around you. Because that's what makes, you know, makes the world go around. Having said that, I want to thank Alibaba for bringing like-minded charity people, like-minded philanthropists, people from all uh, strata of society who are contributing their bit together in a conference to at least talk about it and have a discussion on why philanthropy is important, why charity is important, and so on. So having said that, uh, thank you. It's helpful. <laughs> so let me talk about inception of my journey. Uh, I'm based in Atlanta myself in the US. Uh, I'm an Indian, very proud Indian. Uh, consider myself more of an Indian, though I'm carrying a US passport. But having said that, my journey with charity in a more fundamental, uh, in a more uh, organized way started in 2003. I was in Delhi, absent-mindedly, I walked up to the fifth floor of my building and started looking at the back of the building. And as I was looking back at the building and looking through, I saw a lot of slums. And I immediately had tears in my eyes. I walked down and one of my chief financial officers from the US was there and he asked me, why are you crying? You're an Indian. You've always seen slums, so what are you crying about? I said, no, Dick, that's not the issue. I'm crying about the fact that I've been coming to this building for three years, and I never saw these slums. For me, they never existed. I'm so lost in my power kick of the next business deal and the next thing that I want to do that I never saw these slums. And that's where it occurred to me that I have eyes, and yet I can't see. I realized what I consider a success in my life is not really a success. I've created an illusion that I think is, a success, is, a, is, a, is some form of success. So it occurred to me that I had really not done anything in my life. And I realized that success does not come through growing in business. Success doesn't come through just generating money. Success comes through sharing happiness with others, spreading a bit of happiness, spreading the charm around in people, and that's where my process of rediscovery began. And that's where the foundation was born, uh, the Robin Rana Foundation. We started in 2003 with the thought of basically trying to impart happiness, spreading smiles, trying to make children, building a better future for children and slum dwellers uh, in India and abroad. So when I started on this journey, I realized that I come from a technology mindset. I'm an engineer myself, run a software company. 
and have a few tens of thousands, probably 10, 15,000 employees overall. And I thought, how do we do something that is technology intensive? Why was technology important? Many ways. One, you want to put out a message, you want, to, you want a means where you can reach out to a worldwide audience. You can reach out so that you can maximize the reach. That's one thing. Secondly, what is the one single biggest thing when you talk to people about charity, especially in India? People are cynical about charity. When I speak to people, I hear people tell me, look, I really want to contribute, but I'm not sure the money is going to reach out. So to me, it was imperative that whatever I try to do or whatever we try to do, we create an absolutely transparent means of tracking everything. And I mean every penny had to be tracked. Every dollar had to be tracked. Every donation had to be tracked. So we built systems. We, we built systems to track every donation, every, every gift, every penny, how do we spend our money, and we took it to the next level. I'll give you a few examples of those as I go forward in terms of what I mean by embracing technology and trying to build something uh, and take the power of technology to the people. So one of the, as I started on this journey, somewhere in 2003, the Indian government announced in a big way they're going to hold Commonwealth Games in India. And as they started on this part about Commonwealth Games, they started moving. The Delhi government started throwing the slum dwellers out of Delhi. And basic idea was, we're going to show to the world, India is a superpower. India is amazingly nice, pretty. Palm trees were getting a, a, a pointed, put in everywhere across the airports as people drove in. But poor, underprivileged people from Yamuna Pushta region were being thrown out to a region called Bhavana. Bhavana today is the second largest slum in the Indian subcontinent. Bhavana is not far from where you guys are here right now. Bhavana is basically 30 miles, 30 kilometers away uh, in Delhi itself. 150,000 slum dwellers today reside there in the slums of Bhavana. So as that was happening, it started, occur it occurred to me that why is the Delhi government or Indian government doing that? Why are we throwing our own citizens out of the city? Why? Simply because we think we want to show off. Show off what? That we are not poor? Why is poverty an embarrassment? I don't understand that. I, why? What, do, what are we trying to show? If the poverty is there, this is not something terrible. You got to embrace it. And I, I talk to people, I used to talk to people all the time and I would say, and some people would argue with me and they would say, look, government is trying to do something nice. They're trying to clean the city. And I, I would say back to them that if you're so ashamed of poverty, why don't you do something about it? Meaning, do something. Be the agent of change. These are your people. They have the same vote that you have. Just because they're poor, you can't just throw them off in a God for second place. So we started on this project. It just occurred to me, if I can provide education to these kids, we could probably build a better future, at least for the next generation. And as we started providing education, we realized that those kids were not really, they would not stay in the schools that we had placed. The kids would come into schools. In another five, six months, their parents were like nomads, looking for a job. They would move away, and the kids would clearly go with their parents. So it occurred to me, what is the best way to provide education? How do I guarantee that the kids that we take into our schools are actually going to stay there? And I conceptualized the project to build 6,000 homes. I felt if we, we ran a census and we realized if we can build 6,000 homes in the slums of Bhavana, legal on legal piece of land, give them concrete, proper civic homes, there will not be a slum, there will not be a slum in the area. We would have removed the word slum from this area, and that's what I set out to do in the year 2006. 
I said, let's build these 6,000 homes. And as we set on this path of building 6,000 homes, today, as on, as on date today, we have handed over 2,304 homes, absolutely free of cost, to the slum dwellers of, of Delhi. But as we did that, as we started building these homes, we also realized that we needed to get the message out. I'm not big on just doing PR for the sake of PR, but it was very important to somehow get the message out to a global audience that look in a, a, happy, a happy message. It's not about, I wanted to put a happy message out that look, if you want to be the agents of change, you can actually do something. My feeling was, going back to the millennia story that I gave you, I basically felt if we could be inspiring, if I could inspire a few people to do the same, because there are much richer people than I am out there, I felt I would have contributed a little bit to India as a country, to my own motherland. Having said that, I set out and decided we're gonna use entertainment as a form, and I produced a film at that time called Dilly. Delhi was a story of Delhi slum dwellers, the happy story of Delhi slum dwellers who got thrown out but kept their head high and finally emerged with the identity of their own, an address of their own. Believe it or not, slum dwellers don't have an address if you don't give them a home. And first time they had an address and ultimately, so Delhi went to 25 international, won 25 international awards, went to finals of 83 film festivals, made it to the top 10 Oscar list, lost in the Oscars, uh, beat Robert Redford's movie, Buddha at the Vegas Film Festival. And so it was an amazing way of getting the message out, using the medium of technology, using things like YouTube, Vimeo, but more importantly, using the message of entertainment. And I realized we could really use technology, entertainment in a big manner to get the message out. Uh, and that's where what we did with, uh, uh, with Dilly. I think... The power of technology in charity is clearly big. I gave you already the example. We also, coming back to the message of transparency, today the, we educate thousands of kids. We provide free education to thousands of kid in, kids in India uh, all across the country. We have specific projects only for the girl child, uh, I, a project called Udan in Bombay, the flight into hope for the girl child. Uh, where we provide education in private schools for, for these girls. We have projects for uh, kids in Delhi. We have all across the country, actually, we have projects, and we try to educate these kids, provide them clothing, medical care, uh, and a number of different things. Uh, having said that, we realize that the power of charity, the power of technology needs to be used in a particular manner. So coming back to transparency, at that time, when we went into all of this, I was the primary owner, uh, the donor. Uh, I was putting 90% of what was going into it from my own pocket. But then I realized, look, I want to inspire people. So we started on different projects. We started on a project called Sponsor a Home, Sponsor a Child, and we used the measure of technology. So how do we remove cynicism? So we said, if you are sitting in, let's say, in Uganda, uh, maybe not a great example, but let's say you're sitting in Chicago somewhere and you want to decide, you decide to sponsor a kid in India, you can, you can track that kid's education. You can really track the attendance of that kid. You can track what is the score of that kid in mathematics versus science. And if you, if you send a gift, whether you sent a $10 gift or a $20 or $100 gift, we're gonna track that gift, we're gonna show you pictures of the kid receiving that gift, the family having that. So we built a absolutely a means of technology. We also created mechanisms wherein all our schools were lodging all their expenses, everything was trackable in terms of doing their audits of what was going on with respect to charity. So having said that, uh, I think building, building transparency is rather key in charity, and that's uh, important. Having said that, uh, when you go back to uh, technology, I'd like to give you a few more examples out of Delhi. If you go a little bit further from this place, you're gonna go to Defense Colony Flyover, India's largest blind school 
It's called Blind Relief Association. It's founded by Helen Keller. In the year 2003, uh, we decided to sponsor and ed educate every underprivileged blind kid that comes out of that blind school. Today, what we have been able to do since 2003 till date, every kid who comes out, and I mean every, 100% of the kids, we don't like discriminating against anybody, we educate that blind, underprivileged kid all the way through masters. We use technology to give them that power, that independence. A blind kid, for example, wants to use the same software that we use. They would also like to use the UC browser, for example. How do you do that? So we gave them the software called JAWS. JAWS is a software that reads out stuff to a blind school, to a blind kid. We provided them computers. And this, that simple ability has now given these blind kids the ability to go not only through the master's program. Some of them are now software developers, making $3,000 a month in India right now, working for top-notch companies as software developers while having no eyes, and working as cashiers, teachers, professors, and so on. Uh, a recent project, a good example of charity that I like to give is, a transparency is, we recently took up a project in, if you go to the US, United States of America, you're gonna see goodwill shops. So if, you're, if somebody is underprivileged you, and you want, uh, let's say, a toy for your kid, you can walk into a goodwill shop and say, I need that toy. India doesn't have that ability. So we recently conceptualized a project to start creating, uh, we call it Yogdan. We started creating Yogdan shops. The first one we have created, we created a mall of sorts in Ashok Vihar in Delhi. So what it does, again coming back to transparency, if you decided to donate your number nine shoe, we will barcode your shoe. We will track that shoe. When an underprivileged will walk into this mall, this is a mall only for underprivileged. When they walk into this mall and say, I want a number nine shoe, we will give, take them to the shoe section and they can choose their number nine shoe and when they get that shoe, that shoe has come as a donation from you. We're gonna immediately, you will get an immediate email and you'll be able to see your shoe has landed up with Mr. Ali Muhammad in, in so-and-so slum area, so-and-so address, and if he has a phone number, the phone number of the person. So we created a tracking mechanism whereby people who are wealthy can donate something to the poor and they can track what, whether they're, what they donated actually reached. So this is the first kind of venture that ha is happening in India today. We've already, we teamed up with another charity called Seva Bharti uh, in Delhi to do this. Uh, so I'm very pleased with that project today uh, because it's a clear example of using technology to track uh, charity. Coming back to, uh, I think sometimes we just get carried away. I, get, I do a lot of talking around the world. I have a decent fan base on my Facebook page. Uh, and I, my people keep asking me, look, you have money, so you can donate. You can talk about charity. I don't have money, but I want to do charity. How do I do that? And I always tell them, charity is not about money. Some have it. They're just lucky. Charity is about your time. You got to, if you can do, give your time, that's the best form of charity, to the right cause if you can give time. Again, coming back to that blind school, the example I'd like to give is, go try this out for me. Go to that blind relief association and defense colony flyover. Meet those kids out there. Hold that kid's hand. I am not kidding you, I have done this. You will be amazed. That kid does not need your money. They need your warmth. They can't see, but they have the sense of touch, and they're sincere. When I say always, we as human beings who have eyes, we think we can see, and yet we don't see. A blind kid without eyes can see way better than us. You, let, you keep a cup in front of a blind kid, you're gonna see they're gonna hold their cup like this, they don't have a choice, and they're gonna hold it and drink the coffee like this. Whereas we, I do this all the time, I take my cup of tea and it goes like this, because I'm overconfident. I, and blind kid does not have the choice. Try to give that warmth, and that's what charity is about. Philanthropy is not about money, it's about your time, prioritize your time. People ask me all the time, look, where do you find all this time to donate 
to give to charity. You're running a business across the world. And I tell them, look, it's about priorities in life. If I had to choose, I would choose charity rather than my work. It's about priorities. If something happened to my kid and somebody called me, I could be in a $100 million deal and somebody called me and said, your son has fallen into a swimming pool, which is a real example. What am I going to do? I'm going to run. I'm going to leave everything. Nothing matters. Why? Because my kid is my priority, right? I think that's how we got to treat. When you make your, put your priority right, life becomes better. Life becomes easier. Coming back to priorities, the, the example I also like to give is, a few years back, I was shooting for an for a international channel who was shooting a documentary. So it looks good, you know, when you're shooting a documentary and it looks good, great, to have a small kid, underprivileged kid on your side and they're shooting. So I had this kid called Raghu, a five-year-old kid, who's sitting beside me, had a, he had a banana in his hand. And so I, 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 used, I knew this kid for a long time, and so I, I was kind of playing with him, and so I took his banana, and I kind of I decided I kind of hid it somewhere. In a few minutes, this kid started crying. So I said, okay, I'll give you the banana. Why are you crying? So I, his teacher came in, and I told her, he's normally so happy with me. What happened to him today? Why is he so unhappy? She said, what happened? I told him about the banana. She said, no, you can't do that. I said, why not? He said he does every morning. This kid, when they come for, to school, we give every kid two bananas in the morning for breakfast. What this kid does, he always used to eat one banana. Five-year-old kid. And he would take one banana, put it in his bag. Why? Because he was worried about his mom. He felt my mom might not get anything to eat. He wanted to conserve that one banana to take it home so that his mom could have that banana. I, I get goosebumps every time I think about it, honestly, because I realize, look, I don't have that sense of compassion that this kid has. This five-year-old kid has better feelings for his mom than I. He, and that was an amazing lesson for me as to what charity truly means and what compassion truly means and what love truly means, right? And see, that's the kind of lessons that you learn. Uh, 2006, I went to Pakistan. I'm a, I'm, a Kashmiri, uh, I'm a Kashmiri Hindu by birth. So I went to Pakistan, uh, and I went to our Prime Minister Imran Khan. He started a philanthropic effort called Shaukat Khanam Hospital. So I went to Shaukat Khanam, and I was looking at the hospital, doing a tour, walked into one of the wards, and there was a seven-year-old kid uh, who had a, a drip going in into his body, so through an interpreter, I asked the, uh, his mom, who was sitting on the side, and yeah, this kid was an Afghani kid. So I asked his mom through an interpreter, what's wrong with your son? And the interpreter replied back, uh, basically, that uh, the kid is going to die in two months. He's got blood cancer. I looked back, a Pakistani friend of mine was with me. I looked back, and I saw big droplets of, you know, he was crying bitterly. I was wearing glasses, knew how to control my emotion, and I thought in my mind at that minute, what if I was an angel? What if I was an angel? And I told his mom, Afghani Muslim lady, what if I said to her, look, I'm an angel, I can save your son. All I want is change your religion. Become a Hindu or become a Christian or whatever, right? And I thought to myself, what would this mom do? Her biggest religion is motherhood. She would do that in a microsecond to save her son. And it occurred to me, look, I have, pain feels the same everywhere across the world. It occurred to me that charity should not have any boundaries. I cannot be thinking I'm a Kashmiri Hindu and I'm in Pakistan. I actually should be setting up an example to people to inspire others to tell them that, look, charity does not know any boundaries of religion, region, color, and pain feels the same. So I went in and we sponsored a ward. Beginning 2006, we've been sponsoring the, the cancer treatment of three kids in a cancer ward. It's called uh, Ward 224 at Shaukat Khanam is basically a ward where we try and uh, support these 
uh, Afghani kids. I want to finish by, uh, by talking about two things. I think uh, sometimes we get carried away by who we are. We think we're, sometimes we think we're rich, this will never end, and we think we need more and more. We have one Ferrari, and then we want another one, and then we want a Gallardo, and the next, and the next, and it never finishes. I meet millionaires every day, billionaires every day, and I see that the urge to make money is not stopping. So it came, I came up with an idea, I said, how, what do I do? So I'm presently writing a book. Uh, the title to it is Blueprint to Death. And what I basically wrote, what I'm basically saying in my book is, I don't know how many years I have left in my life, but I feel every individual should do this study and say, look, if I am 50 past, I might have 25, I might have 35 years, whatever they are. What if I work backwards on this? How much money do I need to survive? If I still want to run my Ferraris, I can do that with still $300,000 a year, which means in 20 years, I will need $6 million. But there are million, billionaires sitting on billions. What are they sitting for? What are they going to do? How much are they going to distribute to their kids? So that's basically the concept I'm talking about in my book, that I would like to burn everything I have during my lifetime. I want to burn it. I want to give it away to the underprivileged. I'd like to spread happiness. I'd like to leave an institution behind. Because I know everybody thinks we're, we're, we're just better than the next one. Nobody cares. When I walk down from this stage, a few people will clap, and then the next, next speaker comes in. Nobody cares. What really matters is if you can do something to spread happiness, impart happiness, leave an institution behind you, that will matter. It, Robin Reiner doesn't matter. ABC doesn't matter. What matters is happiness, spreading happiness, giving. And ultimately, giving is the only thing that you can take away with you. It's, it's not possible to take anything else. Finally, I always like to say I want to make charity fashionable and cool. Part of it is, and you saw all these pictures, fashionable, hip pictures. Part of it is, this is what I believe. India is a young country. In a young country like India, where this is, India has this unique opportunity, 65% of our people are approaching the age of 35. Youth, amazing amount of youth. What does the youth want to do today? They want to do what is hip what is fashionable, what is cool. And that's where I felt if charity was considered fashionable, everybody will do it. The youth will embrace it early on. India would be so much of a better country and the world would be such a better place. And that's where I felt, look, let me concentrate on at least in my small way, trying to make charity fashionable and cool. Having said that, I'm gonna shut up and get out of the stage. Thank you very much. Bye.